Okay, so um, signs of a, uh, of a troubled board, that there are cliques, you know? Again, again, this is like junior high. It's not like marriage therapy, this is like junior high, you know, where people uh, talk to others uh, about certain things, but they don't talk to other people. Well, I heard that she told me and he said that. It, 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 this is human behavior. This is, this is, you know, this is group psychology 101. And you want to be able to avoid that. You want, very importantly, not to have meetings in the parking lot after the meeting. I, I, I can't imagine how those can be uh, constructive. If there's a conversation to have, let's have it in the boardroom. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm pretty clear on this. What are you talking about after the meeting that we shouldn't have talked about during the meeting with the three people who are involved in the discussion? And everybody else drives away and they sort of look, you know, while they're driving away, they look back and say, I wonder what those guys are talking about. Oh, maybe they're talking about the game tomorrow or the price of uh, melons in public. I don't know. Um, <laughs> failure to include all board members in critical decisions. This, is in, this sometimes leads us into the old executive committee uh, area. Where, I mean, if you've got a board of 35, it's pretty hard to have everybody involved. But as, uh, as Amada pointed out, as Deborah has pointed out, those smaller boards are nimble. Not only are they nimble, in a positive board culture sense, they're inclusive. You know, if there are only 15 people, this, we say this in our classes. If I had 30 people in my literature class, hard to get everybody involved. But in my independent school, where the ratio is one to seven or one to eight or whatever it is, if I've only got 12 or 13 people in the class, and the head of school comes in and I don't make sure everybody's involved, that's not gonna look good in my evaluation. Well, if Kathy Trower or Deborah, Deborah Wilson comes into a, one of your board meetings, and there are only 15 people there, and only four talk, it can't just be about introverts and extroverts. Right? And if it is, send that introvert the book, uh, what's it called, uh, quiet, right? Help that person learn how to speak up in a group, right? So um, not including everybody in, the, in discussions are, is critical. Um, uh, here, I'm, uh, lack of participation or representatives of constituencies. Um, you know, again, I used to work for a fellow, he wrote, wrote four books on governance. I'm a schmo, I've written one, but like I got nothing compared to this guy. But he used to say, if you're here on behalf of the faculty or on behalf of the parents, anybody have a parent representative seat on the board? Oh, bless you all. Way to go, guys. Uh, faculty, parent, anybody got an alumni seat on the board? Well, Deborah, you've really trained this group well. Uh, congratulations, yeah. Well They're done. just waiting for lunch, Jack. Yeah, yeah, well, I, 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 this is my friend, colleague, and supportive uh, friend, uh, Deborah. Yeah, this is the collegial relationship you develop when you work with NIS. Anyways, love it. Um, uh, again, think about Reisman. Let's protect the future from the present. And if I'm there, even if I said, I'm, I'm with you, Jack, I'm the, I'm the member of the Parents Association or the alumni or the, or the faculty, uh, and I'm there, I know I'm not supposed to represent the faculty, but then why do we call you the faculty representative? You know, culture, language makes a difference. Um, uh, and there's the overuse of the executive committee. Um, uh, indeed, there are things that need to be discussed, but when that executive committee makes too many decisions, announces to the full board that they have talked about it, and this is how they see it, and then the rest of the board says, well, what are we, chop beef? Don't you want to talk about this? It's hard when the executive committee has said, we see the issue this way, for even the most extrovert of extroverts in the most positive board culture to speak up and say, well, I see it differently. Question in the back. Can you talk a little bit about the appropriate use of an executive committee? I, my board is not here, so I'm a little bit confused about that. Like, what is True confessions. I'm happy to talk about this, but Deborah's got national data on this. Go ahead, the national experience. Just national irritation. So if you look at the second bullet and that last bullet, what is the most likely excuse people give for those two things? Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Fiduciary behavior 101, confidentiality, right? I actually had the question. 
Should we get spouses to sign non-disclosure agreements? Uh, full disclosure, I asked her that question. I, I wasn't gonna say anything. I know. But I mean, it's just jumping ahead, right? Well, we just assume everybody's gonna breach confidentiality. You have got to plug this up soon, now, yesterday, last week. Because when you call me with a crisis and you're talking about talking to your board, what's the first question that I ask you? How is confidentiality on your board? Because when push comes to shove, so if you get a letter saying, hey, five of my friends and I were all sexually abused by the entire football coaching staff 15 years ago, you need to be able to have an honest conversation about that with your board. And you cannot bury it in the executive committee because then the rest of the board gets blindsided by it later. So it, it is one of those things that I drill down on every time. The executive committee, if you're gonna use it, it's for business decisions between board meetings, generally speaking, that are already within your budget, within their purview, and you, know, you might fill in the board later, but it's not gonna be a massive policy decision. It's not gonna have a huge impact on your school. A lot of times it'll be used to, um, to review and set a board agenda, particularly if the head wants insight. Occasionally an executive committee is used as specifically a support committee for the head, and sometimes they will be part of your crisis communications structure just because that might be your first stop before being able to pull the whole board together because logistically you cannot pull them all together quite yet. But frankly, even that one is falling off the wayside because, I mean, how many of you have access to Zoom, Skype? Like, you can pull your board together really pretty quickly. Right, right. So, so the confidentiality piece is big, but the executive committee shouldn't be doing everything that the board does. Yeah. Uh, and here, the dismissive behavior among board members uh, and with key staff and faculty. So that toxic board member who, who treats uh, the, uh, the CFO who comes in, the director of development who comes in, um, uh, wh whoever else comes with the head of school to those meetings, when that person is treated disrespectfully, um, then that's a sign. You also want to go back to the whole recruiting process, so back to the governance committee. In the governance committee recruiting process, you need to make it absolutely clear that confidentiality is expected. And if one doesn't honor that, then, then one won't stay on the board very long. That's really hard to do when you're recruiting someone to try and come and join you, especially if that person's a friend, a coworker, or a neighbor, and, and you say, you don't want to say, I kind of hear through the grapevine that you know, you're out there jabbering a lot. You know, that's, we don't need that. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but I fear we are, one of the reasons for having board members who are, no longer have children in the school is because they aren't there. They aren't part of the field trip. They aren't in the parking lot. They weren't at the seventh grade soccer game that went awry. They just sort of hear about it. And as Doreen said earlier this morning, you know, they've, they've lived through the trials and the tribulations of third grade and have discovered that it really didn't matter what happened that afternoon in the long run, that that child went to a lovely high school, went to a great college, and now is doing whatever it is, candlestick maker or baker, whatever they wanted to be. But what happened that day in the third grade didn't matter. But boy, it sure does when it's my child in the third grade, and I'm the board member. How can you not feel that? What, are you dead? You have to feel that for your child. Um, sorry, didn't mean to say that. Um, so here we go. So why, it, uh, uh, um, why this matters? Please. The signs of a troubled board culture. We spent a lot of time on the executive committee. Can you discuss for a second the appropriate use of executive session? Oh. <laughs> we had a. Um... <laughs> really? Don't you want to go to lunch? Um, yes, happy to. Uh, and, I th and again, who cares what I think? There's good research behind this, I think. And it ties in with trust and candor and partnership, the, all the, the models that are tied into that. We were at uh, the Leadership for Partnership, I think two years ago. Uh, the NAS does for board chairs and heads of school, and I don't know, there are 80 people in the room from all over the country, big and small, left and right, all sorts of schools. Um, and we had a very interesting discussion about this. NAS stands pretty firmly on this, and I think they stand on good research, and that they say an executive committee I'm sorry, and a board should go into executive session for two reasons. 
without the head of school for two reasons. To discuss the head of school's performance, and you can do that if you want to. I mean, you're doing it monthly, it's a bit much, but you can do that however your system is set up, as, De as Deborah described it. To go into executive session to discuss the head's performance and to discuss the head's compensation. Other than that, what issue could a board of trustees want to talk about that the head of school wouldn't have important information or insight to share? You don't invite the CFO. You don't invite the director of marketing. You don't invite the director of, of uh, admissions. But if a board goes into executive session every single time you meet, oh, here's the piece of data we didn't collect. How many people meet six or fewer times during the year? Oh, this is a very well-trained group. <laughs> How many people meet seven or more times a year? The more often you meet, the greater the inclination, Trower will tell you this, to micromanage. The more often you meet, the more time your head and her or his senior staff spend preparing for the next meeting instead of doing the work. There are colleges and universities across America that meet four times a year, and they're big. Multi-billion dollar budgets. They somehow do their work. Do you have committee meetings between those sessions? I'm getting off here. I'm going to get back to executive session in a second. But um, meeting too often doesn't contribute to a, board, a positive board culture, and the research tells us doesn't lead to effective behavior. Back to executive, uh, I'll come to you in just a second. But back to executive session, NIS feels pretty strongly about this, and the research supports this. Uh, but I had a board member say to me, well, but Jack, how can we talk about the head and what's really important if he's in the room? Well, if you want to talk about the head, say, we want to talk about your evaluation, so let's talk about that. But how can we talk about the issues that are really important when the head's in the room yeah, I don't know how you have those conversations. So I would argue, De Deborah, jump in here, please, uh, 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 Amada, that executive sessions are essential for those two purposes, but outside of those two purposes, NAS and the research says, you're, you're, destroying the, you're destroying the partnership because the next morning what happens is the chair of the board says, hey, Jack, I want to tell you what we talked about in executive session. Well, what was that? Well, we decided that the tuition increase next year isn't going to be 3.0, it's going to be 2.5. I said, well, that's interesting. So you didn't honor the Finance Committee's recommendation, and you made that decision without the head of school and the CFO talking about the budget, the two people who know the most about the budget in the room. Yeah, but we just thought it would be better. Okay. Or then there's a whole list of things that they did talk about. Hey, we think you need to do more in the communications. Hey, we think the admissions office ought to step up their marketing efforts. Back to the chart that Deborah provided to you. How can you possibly have that conversation without the head of school in the room? Deborah. Yeah, I, um, if you've got an executive session, you as the board chair have to be on it. Like, where is that conversation going? Um, and how many people in here have been through an evaluation? Okay, so imagine at the end of every board meeting, you leave the room, and you know that group of people is going to sit and talk about you. And that happens eight times a year or more. So every time you have that time, and I'm not, I know some schools do this. We actually at NEIS, we always save time for executive session. Usually it was with the president and me, unicorn, yep. attorney yep. client privilege. Yep. Um, but otherwise, the only time they met without the president was during that evaluation and compensation setting window. But just you have to remember what is, what is the emotional message that you're sending to your head of school when you meet without them in executive session. And particularly if the conversation starts to jump the tracks and it's about something that has nothing to do with either of those things, you can invite the head of school back in and say, hey, you know, this conversation is progressing. Would you come back in and join us because we want to talk about X? And as a head, you should be around so that that can happen. Um, because a lot of times that's your board chair flagging you down saying, I can't quite heard this and so I'm, I'm going to need your help to participate in this conversation but just just remember every time the board is meeting without the head the assumption is you're either jumping the tracks or you're talking about that person and you're supposed to talk about the person you're supposed to evaluate the head of school but just keep in mind the trust factor and how much of that conversation is actually healthy and, and if you believe in the partnership model if this truly is a partnership then it's hard to define a partnership when half of the partnership isn't in the room. 